This is a recording for the Story Saving Toby. So you might use this recording actually a few times because we're going to be talking about this story over the course of a few different lessons. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, Saving Toby from Sweet Hope by Mary Buki Bush. Toby motioned for Osvaldo to follow him closer to the river's edge. Sand ripples showed underneath the water until a yard from shore. The bottom disappeared into murkiness. The sandbar was five feet wide and nearly 15 feet long, an easy target. Toby's stones hit the edge of the bar, but Osvaldo's always splashed short. Soon, they were panting from the exertion. Toby poked his toes into the water. Osvaldo took off his shoes and stood beside Toby, the cool water tickling his feet. Toby told Osvaldo how a whole steamship with hundreds of people on board was sitting at the river bottom right there where he was pointing. He repeated words for Osvaldo to say, river, gold, pirates. The river flowed steadfastly past them. Ocean waves pushed a shell or a clump of weeds onto the shore, then sucked it out, then threw it back on shore again. But whatever this river took did not come back. Go on, Toby encouraged him, knowing the dangers of playing in the forbidden river. Go swim, he pointed to the sandbar. Swim on out to the sandbar. He motioned to his waist, assuring Osvaldo that the water was only that deep. Toby found a stick, then poked it into the water as far in front of him as he could reach. See? Ain't even deep, he said. They were standing in the shallow water at their ankle, to their ankles, whipping the stick in the water and stirring up the muddy bottom while the woods behind them thrummed with insects and birdsong. Big old giant fish live out in the deep middle, Toby said. He'd jump on one time, swallow a whole river boat. All one gulp. He squatted down so low that water lapped at his rear end. Then they were both sitting in the water. Toby flung off his ragged shirt. They leaned back on their elbows and let their legs float. The current swaying them toward the landing. Osvaldo heard a sound like branches moving or someone walking, coming from the woods behind them, above the sound of the river. He touched Toby's arm and motioned for him to listen. But no parents emerged, no sisters. It gave Osvaldo a creepy feeling, as if the woods were alive and had eyes. A great white bird rose up from the grassy shore nearby and flapped across the water, pulling its long, dark legs in close to its body, its bulky wings almost digging, dipping into the water as it skimmed the surface. And then the bird rose higher, stretched its crooked neck, made a graceful swooping turn, and landed farther down near the shore. Osvaldo asked Toby if he'd seen the bird, but Toby merely flopped onto his stomach and rested his chin in his hands, his legs floating behind him. Water licked at his face, and he laughed and raised his chin. He had done this only once before alone. But now, with another boy beside him, it was as if he had always played in the river. Then a turtle floated by, and the boys waded in water to their knees to retrieve it. Now that Toby was in the water and his feet were still touching bottom, all the warnings he had heard about playing in the river vanished. It wasn't until his foot slipped and he felt his leg dropping and then his body following the something woke in him he thrashed his arms and screamed for help osvaldo took a step toward him and then stopped toby turned his arms toward shore as the current pulled him slowly in the opposite direction his mouth opened and shut as he tried to cry out for help while spitting to keep the water from choking him osvaldo turned toward the trees Aito! He shouted, Aito! He turned back and shouted in Italian for Toby to swim, and he tried to reach an arm out to him. Finally, he ran for the stick the boy had been playing with and called for Toby to grab it. But the stick was ridiculously short. All the while, Toby's panicked eyes stayed on Osvaldo. His face bobbed further out in the water so that he looked like a flower, a dark, floating blossom. Osvaldo 
stared mutely at the bobbing flower, then took off running for the trees. Their dinner break was nearly over when Fancy Hall and Amelia Pascola each looked up, their noses raised as if catching something in the air. Their eyes moved slowly over the children and adults sprawled around them, and their ears listened, although neither of them knew in those moments what they were listening for. Their eyes met briefly as they rose to their feet. By the time they were standing, what their bodies had unknowingly since turned to sudden consciousness. Within seconds, the entire group was running into the woods, calling for the boys. They broke through the trees into the sandy clearing at the same time as Valdo leaped from the sand into the scrub oaks, shouting incoherently. Step Hall reached out as if to steady himself and caught the boy by the arm. For a moment, Osvaldo dangled in midair while a dozen pairs of, of startled eyes watched his turning feet, the great river flowing be, behind him. Then Step dropped the boy and they ran to her. Fancy screamed when she saw her son slapping at the water, a dull, exhausted look at his face. He had already been carried another 20 feet downstream and further away from the shore. Step splashed into the water while his wife followed. Her arms stretched toward the boy. The others grabbed her skirt to keep her from throwing herself into the river. Step's foot slipped at a drop-off, and he plunged into the water to his waist. He struggled against the current to keep his footing. Someone called for a rope, and the scrawny old man ran back to the wagons. Another man cursed himself for not bringing a rope when they had first run into the woods. Where else would young boys be, after all? Then in the river where they were supposed to be. As if on cue, the black Americans joined hands, making a chain of their bodies that allowed Step to venture further into the water. The Italians added their own bodies as links in the chain, but the water began became too deep and the current too strong. Daddy! Toby gasped as the river tugged at him. The distance widened between them. Amelia pulled Osvaldo close and called the girls to her side. Pray for the little boy, she told them. Seraphin waded into the water, holding onto the outstretched arms until he reached Step Hall, the shouting and crying close in his ears. He grabbed Step's arm and leaned over the river, reaching for Toby as if beckoning him from the water. The motion jarred him. Once again, he was touching his brother Valerio's hand. He held the fingers for a moment, and then Valerio disappeared. He let go of Step Hall. His feet touched bottom for just a moment before the current lifted him, and he started swimming. Fool! Seraphin Amelia shrieked. Come back! Spada watched in horror as his father was carried away. Daddy, he cried out, where are you going? He knew he was the cause of this. Scusa, Osvaldo cried. Seraphin had been foolish young men who thought they could fight the sea and win, a dangerous attitude for a fisherman to have. He never thought of himself as such a man, but now he felt his anger against the river rising, and he tried to calm it. It was the anger that killed you. It was easy to reach the boy as he knew it would be. Returning would be another matter. Toby turned his eyes to Seraphin like a baby waking from sleep. Stay bien, Seraphin told him. You're going to be okay. He slipped his arm under Toby's, lifting him in the water so that he could breathe. Toby whimpered. The water cradled Seraphin and the boy as they held each other. Then Seraphin turned his head sharply to see how far he had drifted from shore. And the sight shocked him. I may as well be in the middle of the ocean, he thought. The water felt surprisingly cold now. It tugged at his legs, and for a moment he kicked out violently, thinking he had become snagged in something. But it was only the current playing tricks on him. He plowed the water with his right arm while he fought to keep the boy above water with his other. He heard nothing from shore, but he saw tense, frightened faces watching him, the way he had watched twice from his boat. The cold water made his legs feel heavy and sluggish. The boy was weightless beside him. 
an empty burlap sack. Sta bien, he called out, his lips brushing the boy's cheek like a kiss. There was no answer, just a slight movement, perhaps the splash of a hand. His arm ached. He wondered how such a small child had been able to swim against the current for so long. He told himself to try not to think about the pain and the distance between himself and the shore. It would have been hard enough to swim with both arms, but this way, holding on to the boy, it seemed impossible. Just one more stroke, one more, and then another, and then another. Lazaro waved his arms at Seraphin as the group followed him slowly downstream. Be strong, Lazaro shouted. Don't give up. Suddenly, Seraphim was afraid. It was as if the river had stopped for a moment, and he could see everything clearly. He had not crossed his mind when he stepped onto the water that he might not come out alive. Now he saw the terrified looks on his wife and children and best friend. Don't give up! Hold on! Lazaro called, and Seraphim was stunned to realize he was drowning. What would happen to his wife and children? How could he leave them alone in the hell he had brought upon them? With the pain of his death to further burden them? Visiting him at Heiner Cemetery, where the rest of the godforsaken Italians lay. A black man waded into the water, extending a rope to Seraphin, then letting it drop when he saw that a rope was useless. Come on, Lazaro, shout a little more! Seraphim blinked his eyes hard, trying to clear the water from them, and he was surprised a second time to realize he had actually inched himself closer to shore, even though the current carried him downstream. Just his fate, he thought, to die like this, not a mule's length from being saved. The group formed a human chain again and eased into deeper water. Seraphim found himself looking into the face of Step Hall, who held the rope. They were shouting at him and at each other, but a rushing sound filled his ears, and he could not make out their words. Step leaned into the river while the others held him, his face tense. The eyes narrowed as he studied Seraphim's face with the look of someone backed into a corner, engaging his last desperate move. Then Step Hall tossed the loop of rope with his one free hand. Seraphim watched as its slow flight in air it seemed to hang suspended in front of his eyes before plopping gently in the water a few feet in front of him. Several times, Step pulled in the noose, then tossed it out again. Finally, he stopped and cursed himself, fretting over the rope as if searching for a flaw in it. Then he leaned forward once more with a steady gaze on Seraphim's face and let go the rope. It sailed before Seraphim's eyes for a moment. A fleeting shadow, a leaf blowing in the wind before floating down over his head. Step let out a quick triumphant shout, then pulled, and Seraphim felt the pressure against the back of his neck. He raised his head in the water and arched his neck to keep the rope from slipping off and then step reached out snagged seraphin's hand and pulled him in step and fancy hall snatched their son from seraphin as he collapsed on his knees ashore he felt the air heave around him like a gust blowing in and out of a room it was his family gathering at his side and then there came a barely discernible touch Amelia's hand on his arm, removing the rope from his neck.